uh, get us uh, in and out of here in the name of the Lord. Uh, you know, Mother's Day is, is always a, a very important and powerful day, not only in the life of the church, but certainly in our larger culture. It is a time where we pause and take a moment to think deeply about the roles that mothers uh, play in our lives, those who speak to us and nurture us, and even those who uh, are carrying around um, all kinds of complex emotions about the day. Mother's Day still provides an opportunity for those emotions to be uh, attended to and, and reflected and taken care of. And so we don't want to just blow past this day, right? We want to imagine what does God have to say to us about uh, the role and the powerful way that mothers and caregivers play in our life. So I was deeply uh, drawn to this passage of scripture in the book of Exodus. It's a, a, a scripture that I have not preached from this passage before, and I was uh, in some reading and studying, and I just was so taken by this passage and this character and this woman, uh, this mother, and her band of caregivers and caretakers. I said, oh, good Lord, this is going to be my Mother's Day message. And so uh, turn with me, if you don't mind, uh, to these passages of Scripture. We're going to start in the first chapter of the book of Exodus at verse number 15, and then we'll go down into uh, the next chapter of uh, Exodus chapter number 2 and continue the story and uh, see how the biblical text, the Word of God, speaks to us today. I hope they have it up on the screen um, and uh, the Scripture... Uh, the scripture verses, is it the next slide or the slide before? Amen. Hopefully one day it'll get up there on the screen. <laughs> Y'all don't have it? All right. Well, if you don't have a Bible and you're dependent on the screen, just trust that what we're reading is from the scripture. <laughs> and hopefully before I'm done reading Exodus chapter number one, Verse 15, Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, amen. We keep praying for our booth back there that the Holy Ghost will fall like it did on Pentecost. <laughs> Fill every space of that room, amen. <laughs> verse number 15, and the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other uh, Peua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. Verse 18, so the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And allowed the boys to live. And the midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Amen. I guess that's one of them uh, 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 useful lies, I guess they told. But anyhow, uh, so God dealt well. Listen to this. God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared or respected God, God gave them families. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw them into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Let's uh, keep reading. And so now a man from the house of Levi, this is chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with a bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it, placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river, and his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. And when she opened the basket, she saw the child, for the child was crying. She took pity on him. 
Then she said, this must be one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Uh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to take the next few moments and simply preach from a passage, simply uh, free mamas, free mamas. And uh, let's uh, figure out what exactly I'm talking about after we have a word of prayer. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Thank you that uh, you continue, Lord, to cause us to hear and read and be transformed by your activity in the scriptures. I pray, God, that you will bless me as I stand here to preach and teach your word. I pray that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. This is our prayer. Bless the hearers of this word as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Somebody say free mama. free mama. Now, you can take that term in one of two different ways or maybe multiple ways, but certainly uh, free mama, if I were just to make that declaration, uh, certainly it would denote that uh, something about our mothers are causing them to be bound and therefore they must be freed or liberated. But then I can also uh, use that as a description of mothers and the powerful roles they play in our lives, particularly by just saying you are nothing but a free mother, a free mama. Amen. Someone who is already free and liberated to move in the power of and the uniqueness of your gift as a mother, the role that you play in so many people's lives. While I was watching TV uh, some time ago, I always am taken aback by the ways in which uh, the monthly income for mothers, those caretakers, if, if you were to add up all the kind of roles and, and, and all the kind of contributions that uh, mothers and, and, and caregivers play in our lives. The, the studies calculate your wages at $117,000 per year. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's like, I sure don't get paid that for what I do. Amen. Somebody say being mama can be a, sometimes a, 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 a free occupation. Amen. A voluntary occupation. Uh, because the roles and the things that are often brought to the table are easily rendered invisible, taken for granted. Um, but how many of you know that there is something unique about how mothers bless us every single day of our lives? I mean, even if we don't have the greatest relationship with our mother, how many of you know you would not be here without a mother? Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. It's a little quiet in here, amen. I hope somebody going to say amen right along through here. Unless you just kind of drop out the sky, somebody carried you and birthed you and, 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 and made sure that at least you got into the world. Yeah. Amen. And uh, if you love your life, you ought to just give your mother a big hand clap for thanking her for getting you and I to this point. Time won't permit me to preach all of these kinds of different variated messages that uh, is in my heart to preach and acknowledge when I think of the roles that uh, mothers play, when I think of the many different kinds of things that Mothers have to endure, mothers have to carry, and mothers have to take on. But I am certainly aware that in many of our communities, mothers carry a particular burden that is often heavy, and that is often uh, without lots of support. And I am 
convinced that part of what the church and we, the people of God, are called to do in this season is to make sure that we make the burden, the load of motherhood lighter. That we, through the ways in which we move and live and, and understand that we make sure that uh, to be a mother is not to be isolated and on your own, but to be a mother is to be welcomed into a community of caring and affirmation because to be a mother means that you have been given the opportunity to help provide life and love and support even if it's not your own child that you gave physical birth to, how many of you know that there's always some folk around you that can look to you uniquely for a word of love, encouragement, and affirmation? And I want to submit that one of the great opportunities that we have is to make this effort of being a mother much more blessed and celebrated. Now, part of what I love this week is that all across the country, a number of our loved ones and allies were uh, launching a campaign, and you kind of see it up there in the back. It was called a national bailout campaign because there are a number of uh, our, our mothers, uh, our women who are now making up the fastest growing population in the jails. And that across the country, even though uh, our men are, are terribly disproportionately and outnumbered uh, by a very, very large margin, the fastest growing proportional population of, of folks who are being incarcerated are our women, our sisters. And often we are finding out that people are being held in jail, not because they're guilty of a crime, but because they can't afford to pay bail. And so in many respects, it is this sense that you already have the burden of being a woman in this culture and society where you have to struggle with all the different forms of systemic and structural uh, patriarchy and you have to deal with misogyny and uh, you are more likely to be abused and, and, and hurt by people that you know and love. And now the system is starting to become a predator on our women and our loved ones because they can't pay bail in order to go home and await a day in court. And so our loved ones in our Movement for Black Lives and others put together this campaign. It was called the Bail Mama Out campaign. And uh, we were able to raise several hundred thousand dollars collectively all across the country and have been bailing out mothers who've been in jail for the last several days and allowing them to come home. And it has been so amazing and so powerful to watch and hear and listen to the many stories of the mothers who have been taken away from their children, not because they've been convicted of a crime, but because they weren't able to, to, to get several hundred dollars or sometimes a few thousand dollars. And even sometimes the bails are set at tens of thousands of dollars just because they are black and poor or brown and poor or don't have good legal representation. And part of what I was thinking about as we participated in this uh, big campaign uh, was thinking about all the many ways in which our mothers are not able to live freely. And it's not the case that, you know, um, at least I am convinced about this, that being perfect should not be a prerequisite for living freely. Amen. Because how many of you know to make a mistake just means that you're human? Yeah. I wish I had some human beings up in here today, man. I know some of y'all, y'all, y'all saints and sanctified, praise God, and you've never made any mistakes, you've never had any struggles. But for the rest of us, amen, uh, to, to, to be uh, a mistake prone is to affirm that you are indeed a human being. And to be a human being means that you learn from your, your missteps, you get an opportunity for redemption and a second chance. But how many of you know none of us should be defined by the worst things we've ever done in our lives, but we should always be able to be celebrated for the possibility of who we have been created to be. 
And so freeing our mothers then becomes uh, both a double entendre. What does it mean for you to live as a free mama? And what does it mean for you to make sure that you are free as somebody else's mother? What does it mean for you and I to be people who are consistently living our lives as agents of liberation, agents of freedom, agents of, that are able to help remind people how you are able to live in the great contributions you can provide into the lives of those who we know and love. Now, when we come to this text, I, again, find this passage to be so powerful because this woman, who many of us, uh, I did not know her name off the top of my head when I was reading this passage and uh, realized that the mother of Moses in this passage, her name is not named in the original part of this story. You actually have to do a little bit of extra digging to find her name. And her name is Jochebed. J-O-C-H-E-B-E-D is the transliteration. Jochebed. And I loved, as we did a little bit of research on uh, the mother of Moses' name, that her name means glory of Jehovah. Her name is the first name in Scripture that includes the name of God. That, 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 that this woman was, 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 was the, the, the bearer of these powerful, powerful individuals, Moses, Aaron, his brother, and Miriam, their sister. These three individuals uh, came from uh, the lineage of this powerful, powerful woman, and yet we see that this woman even though she bore these children, would not have been able to do so without a band of midwives. Yes. Mm -hmm. some, some, some other women who were not named in the text as being those who gave birth to their own children, but figured out a way to preserve the lives of many, many other folks' children. Yeah, y'all gonna wake up on this in a little while, amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, let's free some mamas today. Let's free some mamas today. You gotta realize that there is a powerful, powerful role that God has for every single human being. And today, since we're focusing on mothers and women, every single woman in this place, that God would have you to be someone who can give and bear and protect the lives of all of those that God brings into our world. How many know that's a heavy responsibility? How many know that's a blessed and divine privilege? And if this is the case, that it is heavy, it is responsibility, and it is precious, then every single mother, every single caregiver, every single woman who plays these unique roles in our lives deserve our highest admiration, our highest respect, our highest celebration. Not just on Mother's Day, but every single day. When they grace us, when they're in our presence, what does it look like for us to not call them out their names? Put our hands on them in violent and disrespectful ways to make sure that they are not experiencing abuse Mentally, physically, emotionally, that their bodies are respected, their minds are respected, their souls are respected because of the unique role that they play. And I'm here to tell you today that for all of the mothers that we had to bail out because it cost us so much money, I want to say that the church should make sure that we are not putting our mothers and our women in bondage spiritually, relationally, emotionally. That on this Mother's Day, we as the church have a responsibility to free our mamas, free our mothers, make sure our sisters are free. Why do we need them to be free? Well, the first thing that I feel the text lifts up is that our sisters, our mothers, play these unique roles because they are life givers. First thing I want to say, that they're life givers. Somebody holler life giver. Life -giver. 
The text says in verse number 17 of the first chapter that when the declaration of Pharaoh came to kill all of the, the male children because the country was worried about this growing minority of folk who were starting to outnumber another group of folk, they sent out a declaration that we need to start to control the population. And the way we're going to control the population is we're going to start taking the lives of these children and babies before they even get a chance to grow up. And I don't know about you, but I feel, I feel like we, we, we were given another kind of national declaration this week by the leaders, our political leaders and our congressional leaders who refuse to continue the journey towards ending mass incarceration, ending the violence in our communities, and have made these declarations that now we're going to try to return to another era of punitiveness and punishment. And it's just not going to be the boys we're going to focus on, but as I said, now our women are being swept up into the jails and prisons. Somebody holler, free our mamas. You got to realize that one of the great things that you and I are called to do in this text is to remind ourselves that we are called like these women who were not necessarily the mothers of these children. They did not give birth physically to these children, but they saw these children as their responsibility to preserve and give them life. And this is where I want to talk to all of us who have these struggles about our roles in a society that would love to flatten everything and make you fit in a box. How many of you know your life may be a little too complex to fit in some of folk boxes? <laughs> Hallelujah. How many know there's some circumstances in my life where I am per, uh, playing all kinds of roles to a whole lot of folk? Hallelujah. Today, you may be somebody's mother. Tomorrow, you may be their auntie. The next day, you may be their grandmama. The next day, you may be their tutor or their mentor. But whatever role you play, you are called to be a life giver. We are called to be life givers. And when you and I are able to see and provide the spark of life in the eyes of our children who are often under assault daily. I love in the in the scriptures where uh, the 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 midwives pretty much defied the orders and they let these young folks live. Oh, how many of you know that when you see the divinity in your children, in these young folk, you reinforce God's best dreams for their future. When you're able to see beyond the challenges. Uh, if you go over to the second chapter, um, uh, Jochebed, when she looked into the eyes of Moses, the scripture says that she saw he was fine. And, and, you know, words fail us when we just don't do enough deep uh, engagement because she wasn't talking about, like, fine, like, man, you fine. <laughs> wasn't talking about that kind of fine. Not saying that, you know, he wasn't a good-looking kid, but that there was something a little deeper. The, the Hebrew word actually talks about favor. She recognized some divinity. She recognized that there was something special about Moses, that there was something she could see that drove her to not give up on her unique call to preserve his life. I want to let you know that our ability, mothers, women, loved ones, caregivers, life givers, to see the good in our children, to see the good in one another, must never be forfeited in the face 
of evidence that would suggest the opposite. Hello, somebody. Because how many know there's a whole lot of folk out there that would love to tell you everything that's wrong with the loved ones in your life? And I, I usually tell folk, well, I appreciate your input <laughs> and your reflection. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing about my child that you can tell me that I don't already know. So I'm not one of these parents that, you know, my kids can do no wrong. Amen. Because I know all about them. Amen. I know they sneaky like their father. I know they, you know, when I was a kid, I was a sneaky kid. Amen. I used to steal out my dad's wallet while he was asleep. I used to, I used to play video games at the nighttime when I thought the whole, how you, now how you living in the house, right? And you, this is my daughter. She does it. She loves, you know, she loves technology. My wife, you know, y'all pray for her. She, she, she living in a house with people that are just addicted to technology. Amen. And, and I, I, I try to tell her that I got a little bit of sheep. They got a little bit of that for me. Amen. Because when, when we first got Atari, I remember uh, how I uh, think it was Atari 2600. Is that what it was called? Amen. And I used to just be downstairs in the nighttime, uh, you know, wait for everybody to go to sleep. And I'd just be down there playing Atari, Ninja Gaiden, and all these different kind of games. And I, did, I just thought for sure that I was sneaking and getting away. And now I look at my daughter, and I just be like, so that's what it felt like to my parents. Uh, I think I got that volume down just low enough where it won't nobody hear it but me. Not appreciating that at 2 in the morning, there is no sound in the universe happening. So you hear everything. And then when you ask them what are they doing, they start stuttering. Um... Nothing. No, you're doing something. I know my children, praise God. Because I know me. But I don't fall out of love with my children because they are hard-headed. They got sneaky ways. They kids. Touch your neighbor. Tell them they kids. Touch your other neighbor and say, you was a kid before too, amen. We can't fall out of love with our children. We have to be life givers consistently. Giving them life. Consistently speaking the blessings of God in their life. Consistently seeing them as greater than their worst mistake or condition. Now, all the, the mothers that I've had in my life, I thank God they played those roles for me. Because I'm very confident now that I can be who God has called me to be because I've had some women, my mom, my wife, my female friends, my Aunt Shirley, my grandmothers, all these mothers, I could just start naming them. And I wasn't, my, my, now my mom, Sister Loretta, where she at? She the one that gave birth to me, praise God. But everybody else, they, they, they added thou to it a little bit at a time. And that's what I want to say to you. If you're a free mama, you are able to add to every person something to make their divine purpose known to them and the world. And you don't have to be a birth mother to be a free mama. Hallelujah. Can you imagine what it would have been like in this story if these midwives would not have intervened? If these uniquely situated women in the culture of that time did not protect the babies when the mother was physically unable to do so. Only we in this Western culture have compartmentalized our families and created these false nuclear families where we feel like we don't owe one another love and care and concern for our families. No, the devil is alive. We got to recover and recapture 
that I belong to you and you belong to me and we belong to one another. And so give your neighbor a high five and tell them, come on and be a life giver today. Come on and be a life giver today. Come on and be. The, 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 the question I'll ask you, who are the community of life givers that God has surrounded you with? Who are the people that you need to recognize? There's some folk who are not able to physically birth children. Or some folk who've lost children. Or some folk who are estranged from their children or their mothers. But how many of you know they're in your circle still today? So maybe your role today is to celebrate them. Make sure that on this day they're not mourning and alone if they are mourning. That when you leave church or this week, you're going to make sure that you open and widen your circle of affirmation and let them know that they are not alone. Woo, well, my time is just moving. Who are the community of life givers God has surrounded you with and how can you honor them? Make them visible. Support them. How do you make sure that like in this story, the name is erased? You got to do a lot of digging to find out the name of Moses' mother. The midwives weren't even named, only two of them. So how do you make sure you don't erase folk and make folk invisible? Their contributions in our lives rendered invisible. Oh, no. Give somebody some life by knowing their name, naming their name, celebrating the role that they play. Give your neighbor a quick high five and tell them you are a life giver. You are a life giver. The second thing that the scripture lifts up that I love, that is worthy of our attention, is that these women, these mothers, these caregivers are resistors. They resist. They resist. The, one of the first acts of civil disobedience, if you will, was in this scripture. Hello, somebody. The government puts out an order to start a baby genocide, if you will, and guess what? It wasn't the fellas that jumped up to resist. At least not in this story. I don't know. The fellas may have been somewhere hiding in the background scheme, and I don't know. They may have been. We'll, we'll, I'll do some more research, and I'll come back to you fellas on Father's Day. <laughs> Tell your name, you got to come back on Father's Day to hear the... <laughs> to hear how the fellas resist. But, but in this story, they resisted. The scripture says that she hid him for three months. This is Jochebed, Moses' mother, Miriam's mother, Aaron's mother. She resisted. She did not allow the edict from the Pharaoh, to make her comply when it was causing the death of her children and community. You a free mom, and we got to free some more mothers so we can keep resisting. All of these death-dealing things that are happening in our communities, you got to learn. We have to learn to keep Resisting. Lucy Macbeth that I interviewed, we were talking about how has she, in the mother's days that have come since she's lost her child to gun violence, how has she found herself able to continue on? And I was just so blessed by our conversation. She, she talked about how everything that she does is a way for her to resist dying herself. I mean, this why you this 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 why these conversations are so important. Cause I wouldn't even came up with that. But you have to go through some things, touch your neighbor, somebody, in order for you to come out on the other side with this kind of wisdom. She said, "If I do not do what I do, I may experience another kind of death." How many know when you stop resisting, then you start to die. You start yourself to succumb to the worst conditions. And what I'm so excited and blessed about in this particular passage is that we see both the midwives and Jochebed resisting. 
And their resistance to structural and systemic evil turned out to be a down payment for their children's liberation. How many of you know if, if, if that's a little bit too broad for you, the scripture says that if you resist the devil, that the devil will flee from you. Your resistance alone puts the devil on the run. Hallelujah. And it's just not those systems outside of us that need some resisting. How many of you know there's some things in our own lives if we're going to be free? you got to struggle to resist it. Ooh, I know that I got a little bit of a temper. I know I can't speak the first thing that comes to my mind. In certain situations, I got to resist that old devil. Who that devil? And you know, I am more worried about the devil in me than the devil I can't see. Touch your neighbor, amen. You know, some of us, some of us are focused on all, and I'm not hating on, you know, there is Satan, there is evil, but the only thing God told me to tell Satan is get thee behind me. He didn't tell me to do no negotiations with the devil. Well, you know, Brother Satan, if you would just, you know, uh, 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 you know, if you just stay over there and I stay over here and we don't have to, or if you just don't mess with me on this day, you know, the next day is okay, but this day, no, 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 every day, devil, get thee behind me. I only got one thing to say to you in the name of Jesus. But that stuff inside of me, the scripture says it like this, that you must die to yourself Daily. Woo. That's why we believe in resurrection too, amen? Because if you die to yourself daily, how many know every day is also an opportunity for some resurrection? So what are the things that you got to resist? Both in yourself, both in your community, in order for liberation and freedom to be ours. You can't be a free person and not resist or you will become complicit in both your own oppression, your own downfall, your own worst conditions. No, but guess what? Resistance is not to happen in isolation. This is where a lot of us get in trouble. We get in trouble because we resist by ourselves in the corner, literally in the corner by ourselves. And we try to figure out how come ain't nobody coming to help you. Don't I know where you at? You hiding. <laughs> Hello, somebody. In the text, it didn't say the midwife. Read it on your own time. Midwives. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them we resisting in community. We resisting in community. With, with Joker Bad. Even with all of what she planned to do, she still needed other folk, including Pharaoh's daughter. Lord, have mercy. Now, I'll tell you this one thing. God can even use your perceived enemies <laughs> to fulfill word in your life. Now, I'm not telling you to go run around looking for your enemies and ask them how you're going to be a blessing to me. I'm just telling you, don't cut God short. Because those very folk that you thought could never bless you, God knows how to turn that situation around and cause them to be the source of some healing, protection, help at the time you need it. Pharaoh's daughter could have destroyed Moses before he even got started. But somehow, some way, her heart opened up. And all, listen, all the mother had to do was to be willing to trust God. I can't see what you're doing, God, but I'm going to trust you. And she had to release her son for a season. But God ended up bringing her son right back into her arms. How many know sometimes you got to let some things go and wait for God to bring it? Lord, help me in here today. Wait for God to bring that thing back to you. 
Wait for God to turn that situation around. Anybody ever been working on something and you thought that you had it all worked out? And then you realize, God, I got to let this thing go because only you can turn this situation around. Only you can turn this situation straight. God, help me. Oh, Jesus, Lord, have mercy. So, dear loved one, how are you being called to resist on behalf of the mothers and the vulnerable people around you? Will you return the obligation to stand up for our mothers? Because I have found that the greatest constituency group in our churches and in our communities that are regularly investing in our liberation and our daily well-being are women. But when women are in need, they can often be left to fend for themselves. Amen. I mean, you know, I was at the press conference uh, we were doing outside the Alameda County Courthouse talking about the bell mamas out. And I said, as a church, we have to repent because I've seen mothers, some in this congregation, put up their homes and spend their last dollar to get their son, their husband, their partner, they whoever out of jail. But when they get in jail, ain't a whole lot of resources flowing in that direction. Hello, somebody. It's not to beat up on anybody. It's just to tell the truth. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them that we believe in that truth over here at the way now. If it hurt, all you got to do is just say, help me, Lord. But don't you get no attitude because the truth done came walking down your road this morning. Who will stand up for the mothers? If you a free mama, you got to help free some more mothers. You can be like, well, you know, I got my thing together. I hope they figure that out. No. That's a devilish mindset. That's not the mindset of the people of the kingdom of God. We bear with one another. We support one another. So who are you being called to support? Who are you being called to resist on behalf of? If you don't have the strength to resist because you're resisting too much, who is in your community and your, your circle of influence that God has placed to share that burden so you don't resist to the point of death? Because you're being burnt out. We talked about that heavy load. That, that strong black woman syndrome. That unique burden that women carry around. No, 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 no. Whether you black, white, brown, yellow, red, polka dot, blue. You are not called to carry your burdens alone and God help us as a church to carry the burdens of our women. Help us as a country to do better by our women, our mothers, our grandmothers. They got, Cherise was telling me that they, there was a mother in, uh, uh, how old is the mother? 80, 70 something? 82 years old in jail, and they denied her probation or parole. I'm trying to figure out what use does an 82-year-old woman have in jail? Punitiveness is the muscle memory response for many of us when it comes to our loved ones. Not redemption and second chances. May it not be named among the house of God. We are champions of such behavior towards our loved ones. I know some of our people are a piece of work. Some of you are a piece of work. I know I'm a piece of work. But I thank God that punitiveness is not the first response to my pieces of work. Hello, somebody. And then the last thing, and we're going we gonna, to we gonna be done with this. The scripture powerfully says that because they feared God, God gave them families of their own. Free mamas are God fearers. People who fear, respect, have faith and trust and belief in God. 
And God rewards the faithful. It's not a transactional, formulaic suggestion that I'm making. I'm telling you that when you honor God, God will honor you. God will honor you. God will take care. God gave them families of their own. It didn't necessarily say children. I want to be wordsmithing and doing too much isogesis. But I do continue to believe that we cheat ourselves when we only imagine our own individual nuclear families as the only expression of God's gift to us as a community. I, 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 my daughters are five and eight, five and eight. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been a youth pastor for almost 20 years. Well, you know, been doing ministry with young people for almost 20 years. And I have so many relationships with young people that I did not birth that have taught me so much. When they graduated, I thought I was, <laughs> you know, even though I didn't put too much financially in on it, I felt like I was standing right next to them like, look what we did. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was a hard journey, wasn't it? But God brought us through it. It was just like, <laughs> I had to go to jail for them. Had to talk late in the midnight hour with them. All these kind of things that I'm not even yet done with my own birth children. But God knit a connection between our hearts. That at a season of their life, they needed me. And guess what? I needed them. I needed them to teach me what it meant to have patience. I need them to teach me the latest songs and slang. And, uh -huh. Some of that stuff, they was talking too fast. I just remember when Bone Thugs and Harmony came out. I couldn't keep up with not one word of them. I was like, what are they talking about? <laughs> I, I just stopped trying. Amen. I was just like, well, just give me, give, give me the slow speaking musical expressions. All this, they be like, hey. I mean, like, what are they saying? They just be, I be like, it must be an acquired gift. You gotta learn. Your brain just gotta be on. I'm 41 now. My brain ain't doing that no more. It's gonna be like. But these relationships gave me life. They taught me things that I would not have learned because of their. Fear, respect, faithfulness, faith in God. God gave them families of their own. God will build the community of love and affirmation around you. You continue to honor God. And guess what? Joker man, last thing I'll say, made it into the Hebrews chapter 11 hall of faith heroes. Her act of faith Fullness. Landed her right next to Abraham, right next to David, Isaac. When all them names are mentioned, guess whose name is mentioned? Moses' mother. Who by faith resisted, honored, and respected. How many of you know your Faithfulness to God will take you much further than your own skills and capacity can ever do. Stand with me, everybody. Come on.